Good morning, everyone. It's still morning. Um, my name is Toby Goddard. I represent the City of Santa Cruz Water Department. The City of Santa Cruz is only one of two agencies, Watsonville and the city, that are actually water suppliers as well as land use agencies. So it's maybe appropriate that we talk about connecting the two. We're also going to look ahead 20 years into the time frame that's covered by this um, groundwater sustainability plan. Um, the presentation today, I want to look at four things. I want to look at uh, linking land use and water supply. I know you have a lot of questions about that. I want to talk about um, the current trends in urban water use. We haven't really seen that yet. And in that context, I want to try and answer the question about how much does growth matter. We're going to explore what some people have already uh, alluded to is the population trends and give you some projections. And then we're going to also talk about how the state of California is looking at water efficiency going forward. There were some important new laws that were passed in September, and that will have an, a profound effect on water use in the duration that is covered by this plan. So why is this topic even important? Well, it's important because, for one, you're in a groundwater sustainability. You're developing a plan, and by law, you have to look at land use, and your plan has to address land use that governs the basin and how implementation of those land use plans may affect water use. But it's also important, obviously, you're here. You care about the security and the reliability of water supply. You care about your community. You care about growth and the rate of growth in your community. So this is a really important topic. Um, linking land use and water supply sounds pretty simple to do in concept. Decisions to build rest on having an available and reliable water supply. It's that easy, right? It's actually a lot more complicated. And um, any of you in the water industry that are here know that uh, water reliability and water availability vary dramatically from year to year. Um, there are things that water agencies may do that, that may impact other customers, and that land use visions uh, can always change, and they are always changing, particularly with respect to timing. Let's just look at one image here about variations in water availability. And I know some of you have seen this chart, but this is this is a chart of the total annual runoff in the San Lorenzo River Basin uh, over about the last 100 years. And on the central coast here, we have tremendous variations in total an annual runoff for the river. We use this chart in the city to make projections about our water supply availability. But you've all been here a long time. You know we have dry years. We have years like in 2017 that were like the wettest ever in terms of runoff coming out of the basin. And this is reflective of the area in which you're trying to plan for. Um, now you're thinking, OK, we're doing groundwater. This is surface water. This is the San Lorenzo River. What, why are you talking about that? Well, I think you all know that one, surface and groundwater are interrelated, they're connected, um, or two, uh, water demand uses of water increase when it's dry and go down when it's wet. So the demands on the groundwater basin are going to change with weather. And for three, one of your suppliers, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, has, has surface water supplies and groundwater supplies. So when it is dry, as shown on like this chart, they're going to be drawing more on their wells than they would otherwise have to. So I think this chart is it's really important just to look at the variability in water supply that we're trying to plan around. Um, we've already heard a lot of speakers talk about uh, land use and some of the tools. Um, I'm not going to go into this. I'll try and keep the, the morning move, moving. But we have general plans in the groundwater sustainability area for the Santa Margarita. Both those general plans now are quite old. And both uh, the uh, county and Scotts Valley talked about the process for revising those. There are also specific plans. These are, are more detailed plans for small areas within the overall jurisdiction. You heard about housing elements. Housing elements are on seven-year cycles that have to plan for certain numbers of 
houses or at least have show that you have the capacity of land to develop certain number of houses at different income levels, but they're on a seven year time scale. There's zoning ordinance developments. We've talked about CEQA this morning. And uh, in addition, the county has another couple of tools for managing land use. Those are, and I think Paya uh, uh, alluded to this too, which was the growth management system, a limitation on building permits, as well as an urban service line, which keeps the urban parts of the county urban and keeps the rural parts rural. So those are kind of the tools for land use planning. And let's see what all of that has wrought. So in, in this basin, this is a picture of the assessor. This is how land is taxed in the basin. It's produced quite a, a modern art picture, but, but um, and the breakdown of it is here. About 40% of the land area in the groundwater basin is either is residential in character, either rural residential or maybe urban residential. Another 44% is open space, conservation, or vacant. Those are the dominant uses of land in this area. And I just thought that would be important information to bring. It's mostly either open space or residential. And then there are a smattering of other types which range from our reservoir, the city's reservoir, to um, the quarries, industrial uses, and some commercial areas. But, but by far and away, the preponderance of land use is either for residential purposes or for open space. Now, when it comes to water supply planning, you've got two different agencies. We were talking about the county and the city of Scotts Valley before. Now we've got two different agencies, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and the Scotts Valley Water District. And they have different tools and different almost professional sort of uh, focus. Um, one tool they have for looking long range is the urban water management plan. You heard that referred to earlier. It's a, a, a urban, we're in a rural area here, but urban water means any supplier that, that serves 3,000 or more customers or supplies 3,000 acre feet per year to, to urban water uses. And so both Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley, as well as the city meet that definition. These plans go out 20 years. They have to look out 20 years and they're updated every five years is submitted to the state. The next one is due in mid-2021. And that's a major sort of long-range planning law for, for water suppliers. Water supply assessment is another tool, but this tool really only pertains to large developments of 500 uh, residential dwelling units or more, or in industrial or commercial uh, proposed land uses that are on that scale. And um, I'm not sure that you're going to be seeing anything like that in the near future. So that may not apply in this area. Um, there was mention by John Laird about the integrated regional water plans where agencies are coming together in a region working together. And then finally, I think the, I think the most optimistic tool I can think of for really linking land use and water supply is this process right here about making a sustainable groundwater, really putting all the people in the same room. So I'm very encouraged by, by this tool. Um, it's not that well linked, believe me. Um, it's hard. Um, let's take CEQA for a second. The, the typical analysis that someone goes through when they look at a project on water supply, the criteria within the state law is does it require a new water treatment plant? Does it require a new water entitlement? And it would take a very major project to meet one of those. And so typically in CEQA, projects are not found to have a significant impact on water supply. It's, it's just not a really good tool for linking, say, a 20 unit subdivision with what its effect is going to be on the water supply system. General plans, they're, they're great for saying what can be in a jurisdiction, but the timing is tough. You never know what actually, they're not good for water agencies to make predictions because as you heard today, some things were approved 10 years ago that are just beginning to be built now. So it really is tough to try and, 
connect these things. And there are other factors that are changing all the time. From a water supplier perspective, six years ago, we were going down a completely different track for planning a water supply than we are today. So there's been change on both sides of the water supply and land use equation. But again, I think this, this process, the process of preparing a groundwater basin, getting people in the same room, having education uh, opportunities like this um, are really important. And so I think you're doing all the right things to meet your basic basin management goals. Let's take a look what's, with what's happening with water use. And this is happening all over. What's really happening here is um, this is a map of total water production from the groundwater basin over a period of time. And you're seeing it peak out around the early 2000s and drop off. This is a, a slide I got from Scotts Valley. And I just wanted to show you some of the reasons for that. You've had um, loss of industry. You've had some remediation. You've had water efficiency in existing units. Of course, there was a recession. There's drought effects. There's been changes in the price of water. All these things are changing how we're using water. And speaking of how we use water, if you look at the two major users, most of that, again, is for residential purposes. It ranges between about two-thirds and three-quarters. But I think we're really talking about in this effort is looking at residential use. Now, this is a picture. I brought this along. This is a picture of what's going on in the Santa Cruz water service area. But, and let me just tell you what the top line is the population. The middle line is the number of water service connections. And the bottom red line is our annual water production. And it goes from, I'm not sure if you can see this, so I'll read it out. It goes from 1951 to 2016. And you see the same thing occurring. You see water demand rising sort of in concert with population and account growth. And then at about 2000, it starts dropping. And there's a number of reasons why that's so. But it's the same trend that you're seeing in your own basin. And um, there, there's just a whole host of reasons why that is occurring now. But I will share with you, we were at a similar crossroads as what your organization is going through now in 2000. We were producing about 4.5 billion gallons of water a year with the specter of a new general plan, the specter of a new university long range plan, and a new housing element. And we were wondering as an agency, looking at potentially having to supply 5 billion gallons of water 20 years ago, how are we going to do that? No one could have said in, back in 2000 that you would be producing about half of that amount of water today, which is what we're doing. We're producing 2.6 billion gallons of water today compared to 4.5. 20 years ago. So this is a trend you're seeing all over. It's a national trend. You're seeing urban water use, per capita water use, diving down. Now, so I think this in particular is a tailwind for your planning purposes because you're not really fighting an increase in water demand that you think of when you think of growth. In fact, I'm going to conclude by saying I think your water demand is going to go down for the next 20 years, and that's going to make it a little bit easier. It's still going to be challenging. So I'm going to speed up here. This is a, a, a per capita water use chart, and we'll get to this in a sec, but per capita water use is basically falling faster than you're adding new accounts. So that's what's really going on is everyone is using less water more than you're adding new accounts, and hence your total water production. Let me, I just, I'm not, not, not rushing you, just, I mean, same as the last presentations, um, as, don't forget to sort of stay at pace with writing questions or comments, so as soon as Toby's complete with the presentation, we can go around the room and grab them, so just keep jotting down questions and comments, thank you. Okay, so we're, since we're on per capita, let's go into population, I'm going to skip this slide, this is the current population of the area, let's look at the trends, the big picture here is, in the 60s and 70s, Santa Cruz County was growing faster than the state, as an average, in the 2000, 2010, we're growing slower than the state as an average. There were talks about modest growth. Um, and this, again, is the population forecast 
produced by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. It basically sees the Scotts Valley area as holding steady, maybe slight population growth, but one of the lowest growth rates in the entire county. And then what I did for this presentation was I asked um, a colleague of mine to tease out just the population growth that is occurring in the unincorporated area and Scotts Valley. So this is a 20 year projection uh, as best Monterey uh, AMBAG understands it of the population growth we're facing over the next 20 years. Now these, these forecasts are updated every four years. So you're gonna want to watch this. But what the view is right now is that you're gonna add fewer than 1,000 people in the next 20 years. That's helpful. Now, is it right? Is it wrong? It's official. <laughs> but, but it doesn't suggest we're gonna be doubling the population in the area. So I think this is helpful to know about how many people are in your basin and are they in the unincorporated area? Are they in Scotts Valley? What is the rate of change? What does that look like? So right now it suggests like some of you are already hearing that it's going to be fairly modest. Okay, the last part, since we're talking about um, per person, water use and population, is I wanted to touch on some of the laws that uh, went into effect. This is, this is a repercussion of the drought. John mentioned making water conservation um, a California way of life as part of the California Water Action Plan and um, I don't know, have, how many of you have heard of 20% by 2020, where we had to reduce per capita water use 20% by 2020? So, so that was a law that took effect between 2010, is still in effect to 2020. This next law goes into effect after that. And all the urban water suppliers will be needing to calculate targets that is broken down by indoor use, outdoor residential use, their water losses, their leakage on the utility systems, and on commercial landscape. They're gonna add all that up, and they're gonna have a target, and they're gonna be comparing that target to what their actual use is, and that target is going to be dialed down over time by Sacramento. So I think I will just skip through, but the indoor standard that they will need to calculate is just simply based on 55 gallons per person per day times the number of people in the basin or in the water service area, excuse me. But let's look and see what's going on with water use in some of those residential categories. Here's, I just pulled clothes washers out as an example. I had to buy a new clothes washer over the, over the holiday. Um, so I, that's why I was focused on this. Um, my, I replaced my high efficiency clothes washer with one that is only using 10 gallons a load and has one and a half times the capacity. The, the technolo technological changes in indoor water use that are occurring are occurring at a very fast pace. And this affects all the existing users, not just new customers, but anytime your washer breaks, you're gonna go out and probably choose an efficient product. So this is having an effect on, and one of the reasons why per capita use is falling. The same thing is true for toilets. Toilets have come from five gallons to 1.28. It's tr true in a big way for dishwashers and other appliances that we all use every day. Remember, most of the water use is residential, and most of the land use is residential. So this is the kind of thing that's having an effect on the production of water in your basin. We've modeled it. And we see in the city, our residential use, I'm, I'm sorry, our total water use, going down almost 9% in the next 20 years. That's useful. That's a data point you might say, okay, we can count on a continuing reduction just through the changes that have happened through national and statewide plumbing codes. And I think the state law will continue to put pressure on the water utilities to reduce their water losses, to reduce outdoor water use and some of these other things. So I think there is still a lot of room for improvement in water efficiency and the manufacturers are still looking for ways to bring it down themselves. It's a global market for a lot of those appliance manufacturers. They're looking to spread their equipment a lot of places just besides the US. I'm not gonna go into the outdoor standard, but I don't really have time. 
but we're going to be adding up these components and coming up with water targets for every urban water utility. We're going to reporting our comparing our targets with our actuals, and we're going to see where everyone's at. And that's going to itself, by, by publicizing that, is going to put pressure on water utilities to uh, help bring water use down. Uh, when, all, when does this all take effect? About the same time your basin plan has to be done and then going forward. So all of this is relevant information for your water supply planning in the groundwater basin. The question is, I think, the key is what's going to have more of effect? Is it going to be the addition of a new business? Is it going to be a new residential project? Is it going to be a home? Are the increases in water demand going to have more of an effect? Or is it going to be water efficiency acting on all of the resonances in the basin? Is that going to have a greater effect? I personally think that's going to have a greater effect and help you bring your basin into sustainability than projects that are highly visible, that are talked about, that are feared in some cases, that may actually add real gallons, but there are not as many gallons added as gallons are being uh, uh, sustainably used. So that's my message. I hope I hope it comes out that way for your sake. I know you will solve this problem because you're all here and you're all interested and you have the energy and enthusiasm and desire to do it. And uh, I've already said it, so we don't need to do the wrap-up page. And do you want me to answer the university question? So, so let me just, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, let me, let me say it this way. The university has more than doubled its enrollment since 1986. It was 8,000 enrolled students in 1986. It's 19,000 students today. Its water use hasn't changed. It has not changed. Of course there is emotion behind the growth because its effect is real in other areas notably in housing, but also on a number of other areas. But in terms of water use, through efficiency improvements, through things like advanced metering that some of the agencies, I know Scotts Valley is halfway through a rollout of adva advanced metering in the Scotts Valley area. All those tools are going to help. But by doing a number of things, the university has actually maintained its water use steady. So at least for right now, that may change in the future, but they've been they've managed to stay within basically the same overall area, and that's been that's been really helpful for the supplier uh, to not have to look at something that's doubling or quadrupling in parallel with an enrollment. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I'm on. Okay, good. All right, we're going to move on to other. Uh... <laughs> Okay, again, I'm going to try to go through as many as we can. Um, when someone said water usage, when someone said water use is less with more population, are they comparing within drought years or comparing drought years to rainy years? And how is recycled water accounted for in these measurements? And again, some of these may be better to some of the water agency managers in the next panel. So I actually, I, I forgot to mention recycled water, but that was part of your production curve going down too. It's the decision and investment by Scotts Valley Water District to put together a recycled water project. And I think that was forward looking and that will also help your basin if they can continue to, to make recycled water more available. Uh, first a comment and then a question. The presentations were very informative. Thank you. Um, how are projections made such as those for decreasing growth rates for population and water use? a consultant. <laughs> no, uh, the, I've actually, I've actually tried. The wrong answer. Tried doing, I've tried doing projections myself for, for a number of years, and I have to say, every time I did it, I was wrong. But I'm in good company because a lot of communities have tried doing it, and they always look like upward sloping with population, and that's not what's been happening in the last two decades. And um, 
literally we did hire a consultant to help us look at more more a sophisticated econometric water demand projection. We have to do it, and the water suppliers have to do it every five years, and it has to go out every for 20 years, coincident with their urban water management plan. So you'll be seeing new projections come out um, in mid-2021 for the two water districts here. Is it possible that water conservation technologies will reach their maximum ability to conserve water so that their use alone will not be able to keep up with population growth. Are we using wishful thinking here? I thought that 10 years ago. And you might say that today. I, I think there's a point, yes, where we get to some minimum 30, 25 gallons per person per day, and we're so tight that we're not really, unless we totally sacrifice. We're not talking about sacrificing every year, though. When we're using water efficiency, we're talking about reducing the amount of water we need on a per person basis and still have the same, same standard of personal care, of cleanliness, of drinking, of the same thing as you would want. We all know that there's a willingness in this community to cut back when it is dry. People naturally do that. But yes, there is a whole body of literature talking about demand hardening that is concerned about conservation reaching its end, and then what? Why is the city of Santa Cruz not requiring the university to provide their own water and housing units to alleviate artificial housing shortages impacting the city, which affects drawing water from the San Lorenzo Valley Water District? Well, I can't, I can't speak to the housing. Uh, we, the city does not have power over the university. They are constitutionally sovereign. We are their supplier. We are their butler. The city serves them. Uh, they, they literally are a separate entity. Are they preeminent over the city? I would say not, but they're, they have, they're like a separate city or an organization, and we, we, we wanted them, and we supplied them. They are our customer. Why isn't CEQA a good tool to manage water resources since all projects are required to evaluate water use increase due to their project? It comes down to the fact that there's not a good thing the developer can do to solve the water supplier's reliability problems. CEQA is about applying mitigations to reduce the effect on the environment of a development project. What can a person who's proposing a 20-unit apartment complex do to solve the water supplier's reliability problem. It's not a really good tool. They can certainly mitigate it with landscaping. We know that and have been doing that for a long time. They can install water-efficient equipment. Beyond that, there's little they can do short of paying, I think there was reference to paying their fair share for the connection to, to um, cover their costs of of developing additional supply. By the way, if you all see me putting cards over here again, it's I'm, I'm grabbing cards to hand over the next panel I think are applicable to them. Um, while your charts show a decline in recent years, when this is a little similar to the previous question, but not exactly. While your charts show a decline in recent years, when do you project this to level off and meet or exceed water availability? Yeah, that's a great question, because I saw that for California as a whole. California is just under 40 million people, and it's going to 50 million. And the state is worried about the delta. You all know this. How are we going to serve water for 50 million people with the delta the way it is? And so they were actually planning to 2100, and it was somewhere out in the 24, uh, excuse me, the 2040 time frame where they projected instead of urban water use declining, it would bottom out and then go back up with population. So there may be that point. I don't think we're there yet, though. I don't think we're there yet. There's still a lot of homes out there that have equipment that can be replaced that adds a lot of little things in everyone's home, adds up to a declining water production uh, future. A different problem for people to have to manage the financial resources in set rates. You know that, but I'm not going to go there now. Ask the, ask the water managers about, about rates and, and the effect this has. It's very real upon how we set rates because um, it, it's a challenge. 
to balance the financial side with the resource side. Okay, um, we, a number of the questions that came in are really, I think, are really much more applicable for the four water managers. So I've, I've set them aside. I'm going to hand them over to that team in just a second here. So uh, please give a round of applause again to Toby.